We turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter. Isaiah chapter sixty. Six zero. That's correct. Any particular verse? What's that? Any particular verse? One. And I think we're going to read them all. It's a little bit long, but our passage tonight is short. It's what? Short. You know, the, our, the passage from Matthew is uh, three verses. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar. And I shall glorify my glorious house. Who are these who fly like the cloud and like the doves to their lattices? Surely the coastlands will wait for me. And the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar their silver and their gold with them for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you. Foreigners will build up your walls and their kings will be ministered to you. For in my wrath I struck you and in my favor I have had compassion on you. Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed day or night so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession for the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish and the nations will be utterly ruined the glory of Lebanon will come to you the juniper the box tree and the cypress together to beautify the place of my sanctuary and I shall make the place of my feet glorious the sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you, and all those who despise you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet. And they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. You will also suck the milk of nations, and suck the breast of kings, then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. And instead of wood, bronze. And instead of stones, iron. And I will make peace your administrators, and righteousness your overseers. Violence will not be heard again in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor, the brightness, uh, nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. And your God for your glory, your sun will set no more. Neither will your moon wane, for you have you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be finished. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The smallest one will become a clan, and the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. Amen. 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 That's quite 
So that was what Jesus had offered to the nation of Israel if they had received him as their king. But they rejected him. We saw the rejection clearly in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus begins to speak of a different kingdom. And he says it's a mystery kingdom. I'm teaching you the secrets, the mysteries of the kingdom. And we remember that uh, we ascribed five different facets to God's kingdom program. He had been speaking to the nation of Israel about bringing in the uh, what we call the millennial kingdom. God's direct reign upon the earth through our King Jesus. But now he talks about another facet that nobody had heard of before. It was not revealed in the Old Testament. Therefore, it's a mystery or a secret. And he's, in these parables, he's giving us some general characteristics of this kingdom for as long as it lasts. So we looked at the parable of the sower, which had to do with the word of God being spread throughout the world and how it was received by four different categories of people. Some people rejected it outright. Some people uh, couldn't hold on to it. And then he spoke the parable of weeds or darnel or uh, tares, I think, King James. And we see that throughout this the history of this kingdom, there are going to be, there's going to be false word given out. And there are going to be people who believe the false word. And Jesus says that those are the sons of the evil one. But allow them to exist side by side with the good seed, with the true sons of the kingdom. They'll be separated at the end. Then he gave us the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven, which both had to do with the growth of the kingdom. Phenomenal growth, going to fill the earth, but not necessarily a good thing. Uh, the parable of the mustard seed speaks to the growth of the church as it deals uh, with the political kingdoms of the world which is not a good thing for the church. The church is the true counterculture. And the leaven, which so many people think of as a good thing, but it's really not. Leaven is sin, uh, and it's compared to the sin of pride. But it also has to do with false teaching. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. Beware of their teaching. Don't pay attention to it. It is false teaching. And so the church, to a large extent, uh, has uh, had false teaching within its midst. And as we go through history, we see that for a long time, the church subscribed to the idea that uh, you were saved by your affiliation with the church. You were saved by your receiving of sacraments. You were saved by your uh, obedience to the... To the uh, hierarchy of the church to the priests and bishops and cardinals and archbishops and all of that. So we see that uh, the church or, or Christendom, I should say, in the world 
uh, is not necessarily a good thing. Christendom would include cults that call themselves Christian, but uh, because you know, of their, their fruit, their doctrine, they clearly are not. Then we come to two, parallel, two parables that incorporate two sentences, uh, three verses, why one is split into two verses. Is we can blame that French printer again. <laughs> uh, but it says, uh, starting in uh, Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And he, upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And there's a traditional understanding of these parables. And it goes something like this. You'll find variations on this all over the place. But it says uh, in this one version of it that there was no doubt in the mind of this man that the treasure he found was worth everything he owned. The scripture said he joyfully sold everything he had so that he could buy the field. When we truly realize the worth of our salvation, we will joyfully give up everything to serve God. Anything that we give up will be nothing in comparison to the treasure of God. That you can sell everything you have in order to purchase salvation. Well, let's lay down some rules of understanding. In, in the uh, first parable, who is the man? Who? Jesus. Jesus is the man. Jesus is the one who, who sows uh, the, uh, the word. How about the second parable? Still Jesus, right? The man is still Jesus. So why would we change when we get to this parable? Let's, let's have another look at it from, from the uh, traditional interpretation. First of all, let's look at the first parable, which is the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and then he hides it again. He doesn't buy the treasure, he buys the field. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Jesus is the one who finds the treasure hidden in the field and sells all that he has to purchase that field that has the treasure in it. Well, I'm going to propose that the treasure is Israel. Israel is the field. And it has a treasure in it. We look at some Old Testament scriptures. Uh, Exodus 19.5 says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Now that phrase, my own possession. I don't know why our modern English translations, well, even King James Version, doesn't exactly get that right. Uh, Young's literal translation says, a peculiar treasure more than all the peoples. Young is getting it right. It goes along with the, uh, <coughs> the Old Testament published by the Jewish Publication Society, which uses the same language as Young. A peculiar or special treasure And in Deuteronomy 14.2, it says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession 
out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Once again, Young says, uh, Young uses that phrase, a peculiar treasure. Now, peculiar has kind of changed its meaning in the, uh, in the last few hundred years. You know, we think of peculiar, you know, as somebody who's a little bit strange, maybe. You know, they, those are peculiar folks over there. Uh, but originally it meant special. Isn't that special? <laughs> uh, Young says, For a holy people thou art to Jehovah thy God, and on thee hath Jehovah fixed to be to him for a people a peculiar treasure out of all the peoples who are on the face of the ground. And once again, the, uh, the Jewish publication Bible says pretty much the same thing. So... <clears throat> That, that idea of a treasure is there in the Old Testament. And in Deuteronomy 32.8, it says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. And it says, he found him in a desert land, and in the howling waste of the wilderness, he encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye, or the apple of his eye. Hebrew doesn't actually have a word for pupil, so they use the word apple instead. That's where that comes from. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided him, and there was no foreign God with him. Apparently, God loves Israel. God considers the people of Israel as a treasure hidden in a field. There, there's a theology that is quite prevalent. You know, we're talking about false teaching within, within Christendom. There is a false teaching that's quite common that God has cast off Israel, uh, that God has replaced Israel, and that we can read the Old Testament scriptures, if we read them at all, and anytime we see anything good in there, uh, we can apply that to the church. Now Paul clearly says, he asks the question rhetorically, he says, has God disowned Israel? May it never be. Well, but that's the true Israel, right? <laughs> and there's, there's some convoluted logic there that says, well, the true Israel that Paul's talking about, well, that's... Uh, true believers, followers of Christ. And the promises have not been taken away from Israel. They've just been transferred. You know, like if I uh, uh, had a thousand dollar bill and I say, I'm going to give this to Don. This is Don's forever. But I'm going to transfer it to Tim. Now, some people think that's good, you know, sure, why not? Uh, now, Don might disagree, though. <laughs> Don might think that that's kind of convoluted logic. Logic. I would agree. And when we use that terminology and say, well, the promises to Israel have been transferred to the church, that's leaven. That's, that's a, I think, precisely what Jesus is talking about, that the mystery kingdom will be full of bad teaching. Now, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with salvation. So uh, there's, there's a lot of folks that, uh, when they uh, come into the kingdom, they're going to have a lot of bad habits that are going to have to be changed. But 
a lot of bad teaching that uh, we're going to have to get rid of. And, you know, I'm ready for that. It's okay. I can't wait to sit at the Lord's feet and have him say, this is how it really is. But Israel, uh, if we read our scriptures correctly, or just read it, and read it for what it says, uh, like uh, in Jeremiah 31, 35, which says, Thus saith the Lord, who giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, who stirs up the sea, that the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances, the ordinances of the sun, moon, stars, the tides, if these ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So if the church is the inheritance, inheritor of the blessings of Israel, then we have to assume that uh, something's happened with the uh, sun, the moon, the stars, and the tides, that they're no longer functioning, right? According to what God says. It seems likely to me that Israel, the people of Israel, are the treasure hidden in the field. And what did Jesus do with it? He hid it again. Uh, they're, they're hidden. Now, does that have to, anything to do uh, as far as salvation for individual Jewish people? None at all. Uh, you know, the uh, gospel writers were all Jewish. The early church, all Jewish. They're, they've been a blessing to us. But what was the general condition in their time, in, in the time of Jesus? The general condition of Israel is given to us in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? They were salt that was not salty. But they you know, he didn't say you're not the salt of the earth anymore. He just said you've been you've become tasteless. This is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. He says, You are the light of the world. A city set up on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. So why have you done that? This is this is essentially the question but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. You know, when Jesus, you know, we try to make the Sermon on the Mount the, uh, the ethics of God's kingdom, which, you know, by application, you can do that. But the actual thing that Jesus was talking about is was he was admonishing the people of Israel, because that's who he was speaking to, uh, for being salt that was tasteless for being light that didn't shine. They were not fulfilling their mission. So if we're consistent in the uh, symbols of the parables, we would see that the field is the world. And Israel, as a nation, is hidden in the field of the world. Now, wait a second. Doesn't, doesn't God own the whole world? He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. And, you know, the whole earth is mine. I think we just read that from Deuteronomy. Uh, <clears throat> but we've got this uh, scripture in Luke. It says, where the devil led Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He took him outside the... Uh, space-time continuum to another dimension and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a flash. 
And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. Now, two points. One is that Satan never had control of the physical earth. He had control of the politics of the earth, the kingdoms of the earth. And ultimately, God is going to, uh, with his kingdom program, as Arnold likes to call it, he is going to reclaim all of those political entities of the earth. But they're all still under uh, the control of Satan. And it appears in Daniel that each kingdom has its own angel that is allowing the forces of evil to go so far, but no farther. Remember we saw the angel, the prince of the power of Persia that withstood uh, Michael the Archangel, I think, for 21 days. The political entities of the world are under Satan's control as far as God will allow. But Israel, because of their sin, which is, you know, their sins of idolatry, their sins of refusing to accept their Messiah, uh, has to be redeemed. John, chapter 1, verse 10 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And he came to his own. You know, those who had received the promises of the prophets read them every day. And those were his own, who were his own, did not receive him. But as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. <clears throat> Within this thing called Christendom, there are individuals who are not following the rules of an organization, uh, who are not uh, receiving mystical sacraments necessarily, uh, there is a thing we call the church, which is kind of an undercover operation. We're in the world, but not of it. So everything that calls itself Christianity is not really. A lot of it is of the world. It is like the mustard seed that grows to be like a political entity. And we can just look and look around and see that that has happened and continues to happen. Uh, and we see that it's full of leaven, bad teaching, uh, completely heretical teaching. But there is two entities that are part of God's mystery kingdom. And one is the treasure hidden in the field. I believe that it is Israel, national Israel. So when are they when are they going to be unhidden? When are they going to become saved? Well, Zechariah Chapter 12, verse 10 says that I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. When God says the timing is right, he will pour out that grace, that spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will understand 
who their Messiah is and what they have done. Paul says in Romans 11.25, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. Could this be one of the mysteries of the kingdom? One of the secret, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The fullness of the Gentiles means the perfect number. God says, I want so many Gentiles in my kingdom. I want to save this many Gentiles. He knows the number. I don't. How many millions? When that number is reached, that's when God is going to pour out the spirit of grace and of supplication. Paul continues and he says that so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And then he says from the standpoint of the gospel, that was at his particular time, for the stand, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So when is the salvation of Israel? When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Can't give it a date. And we don't know the number. When he pours out the spirit of grace and of supplication upon them. Won't happen till then. So then we have the parable of the pearl of great price. That's not a book by Joseph Smith. Uh, it's a parable of Jesus. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. Once again, we have a man seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And the traditional understanding is pretty similar to the first one. In fact, some of the commentaries say they really both mean the same thing. It's just a... One's a repetition of the other. Uh, but in the traditional understanding, uh, the seeker, the one seeking, is you. You're the one who has sought God. You had an, uh, a need in your life to know what the meaning of life is. Well, and that's you know kind of reasonable. Some you know people say they want to know the meaning of life until you tell them. Nope, not that one. <laughs> Don't want that one. And the pearl, uh, in the traditional understanding, is sometimes the gospel, sometimes the kingdom of God, sometimes salvation, sometimes God himself. The problem there is, Paul once again says, quoting from the Old Testament, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Paul is building his case for the fact that we can't save ourselves from being obedient to a law, even when it's you know the one that God carved with his finger on tablets of stone. First of all, we're, we think we're obedient to it, and we're not. We, we've missed. There's none righteous. There are no seekers, really. You know, it kind of puts the kibosh on this idea of seeker sensitive, because there's no seekers, unless God has 
given them the grace to begin the journey. And if he's done that, what they need is the Word of God. So who is the seeker? Now, the man in all of the parables is Jesus himself. He is the seeker. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus is the seeker. So for seeker sensitive, we should be sensitive to Jesus, right? So, how about this pearl? A pearl of great plot price. Well, pearls were not much esteemed in Israel among the Jewish people, you know, because they're from oysters. Oysters are not kosher. And I'm glad I'm not under the law because I really like oysters. <laughs> My uh, personal record is three dozen. Lots of, lots of Tabasco sauce and lemon juice. And they're wonderful. It's cardboard for all that stuff. <laughs> well, they're kind of lowly creatures, you know, they're, they're pretty mindless. Uh, they're bottom feeders, you know, they eat waste, but they produce pearls. After a fashion. What's that? After a fashion. After a fashion? After a fashion. It has to be an irritant for them to produce. Right, they have to... Uh, it comes from irritation, uh, which would, if uh, the pearl is a symbol of Gentiles, then we're, you know, we're kind of irritating the folks. <laughs> so, I think the evidence is that the that, that, uh, pearls represent Gentiles. Now, notice that the, uh, the Jesus, the man, was prepared to sell everything he had in order to purchase the, the pearl of great price. Jesus is the one who has something to offer. We don't. We're not, you know, we didn't start out seeking God. But some of us were probably dragged kicking and screaming into the kingdom, saying, no, no, I don't want to be saved. But it just you know, happened that way. God had his way with us. But we, to say that we were seeking God is really not scriptural, and it really is contrary to human nature. The reality is that he's the one who paid the price for all of us. He paid the price both for the treasure hidden in the field and for the pearl great price. Because we were in need. We had nothing. We had nothing to offer. And yet he esteems us. Paul puts it like this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. We were dead in our trespasses. Dead men are not seekers. Dead women are not seekers. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive, together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus." so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Really clear. We don't seek, we don't purchase, we have nothing to offer. We receive the gift that God offers to us. And that's it. Let's pray. Lord, we are truly thankful for this gift that you offer to us, that you lead us to, that you have sought us, that you have found us, uh, that you have purchased us. Lord, we uh, are just grateful for what you have done. And we pray for the time, Lord, that uh, your kingdom comes upon the earth, uh, that uh, your kingdom, your righteousness uh, will dwell uh, in the nations of the world and that the earth will know your peace. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.